presentation on rising outlet syndrome. We will talk about the presentation, the diagnosis of and intervention for thoracic outlet syndrome. This lecture has been presented before. I presented it in 2020 at the Inter International Pain Conference Advanced International Pain Management in uh, India and was also presented virtually, presented virtually uh, to the Malaysian Society of International Pain Physicians in October 2021. In this lecture, we will talk about several things. First and foremost, what is thoracic outlet syndrome? How does the patient present? Diagnostic workup and examination. Conservative intervention, surgery or non-surgery. How do you distinguish between the two? What are the criteria? And what if surgery fails? What do we do now? Now, thoracic outlet syndrome is a well-known controversial topic. Atasoy, from 1996, they write that thoracic outlet syndrome may be one of the most underrated, overlooked, misdiagnosed, and probably the most important and difficult to manage peripheral nerve compression in the upper extremity. And they also state that it might be one of the most controversial subjects in medicine, which is quite interesting. Paulson, in their systematic review, they stated that the review was complicated by a lack of generally accepted diagnostic criteria. And they conclude that thoracic outlet syndrome is one of the most controversial diagnoses in clinical medicine. Silva and Selmanowski state that TOS is not widely known and it is also a controversial issue for some physicians. They even say that many physicians strongly deny its existence, especially if they have not had the opportunity of diagnosing it in person. Now, regardless of this predicament, a quick uh, search on PubMed will yield more than 3,000 hits on thoracic outlet syndrome. So although controversial, it is certainly a very popular topic. And uh, in my experience, a very common affliction. It is, a very, it is not rare, it is common, but it can be difficult to diagnose, especially because electrodiagnostic workups and imaging studies have low sensitivity for this problem. Now, what is thoracic autosome? TOS is a combined neurovascular compressive disorder with neurogenic predominance, meaning that the majority of patients with TOS will have neurogenic symptoms. They will have symptoms of brachial flexopathy. About 15-15% 10, 10, of these patients may have vascular variants, predominantly vascular variants of thoracic outlet syndrome, where either they develop venous insufficiency in the arm or arterial insufficiency. TOS is comprised of two muscular and one bony compression site. So we have the inter interscaling triangle where the brachial plexus passes and the subclavian artery. The subclavian vein actually passes anterior to the anterior scalene. So it passes between the anterior scalene and the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The neuromuscular, neuro neurovascular bundle in its entirety passes through the um, costoclavicular space, meaning between the first rib and the collarbone, and then afterwards it passes underneath the pectoralis spinal muscle. There are also peripheral entrapment sites associated with TOS. For example, the uh, coracobrachialis uh, muscle through, through the coracobrachialis muscle passes the muscular cutaneous nerve um, in the, through the quadrangular space passes the uh, axillary nerve and so on. So several secondary entrapment sites that we often see in these patients that might need treatment as well. Now the most commonly associated comorbidities or predisposing factors with these patients, it's usually stress anxiety or some kind of head and neck injury. In my experience, and this will probably be a controversial statement, but in my experience, I've found that about two thirds, 
So more than 60% of TOS patients, they develop this disorder due to some kind of stress problem. So either being very tense, not breathing well, suffering from severe, well, not necessarily severe, but suffering from anxiety, PTSD, also obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder can trigger this, ADHD can trigger this, being very tense, anything that will cause you to be very tense and not breathe well, holding your breath a lot. If you do that, not for a couple of weeks, but if you do that for years and years, you can certainly, and many do, develop thoracic autism due to this. As I said, and as I insinuated, about one-third, 25% to one-third of patients who develop thoracic autosynome develop it after some kind of head and neck injury. So that's another known and important predisposing factor that you should be aware of. A small portion of patients, I, I don't know exactly how much, but maybe 5%, will develop TOS solely due to severe scapular dyskinesia. So they might not have anxiety, they might not have suffered any head and neck injury, but they have severe scapular dyskinesia, meaning that the collarbone draws heavily down as they articulate with their arms, causing insult to the brachial plexus, repetitive trauma. Patients with thoracic autosynome will typically present in various ways. It is well known that it is, the patient's symptoms are unique to each patient. For example, one patient may, might only present with pain in the arm, or another patient might predominantly present with carpal tunnel syndrome. Another patient might have pain everywhere, chest, neck, uh, arm, everything. Another patient might just have neck pain. Another patient might just have, have uh, chest pain, etc. However, an important clue here is that a patient who develops any kind of, you know, upper, upper extremity, neck, neuralgia, especially if it doesn't fit the dermatomes, i.e. not being immediately indicative of radiculopathy, that worsens with arm loading. This is a very important, very, very important clue. If it worsens with arm loading, for example, if the patient has a lot of these symptoms after carrying groceries or uh, being in a gym and bench pressing or um, doing the dishes perhaps only happens when they drive or static positioning any kind of arm loading would strongly suggest thoracic autosome in my experience especially if they have a non-compatible MRI we're going to get back to that Further clues would be history of anxiety or OCD or anything like that that I already mentioned earlier. History of head and neck injury one year or less prior to onset of symptoms and or extreme scapular dyskinesia and very usually very low shoulders in posture. Common comorbidities that might seem irrelevant are migraines, fatigue, occipital headaches are actually very common in TOS. Sanders, Richard Sanders, stated that up to 86% of TOS patients suffer from occipital headaches. Tinnitus might certainly occur, and we, we would you might see that the symptoms worsen with arm loading. There are some caveats to that when it comes to the craniological comorbidities because it has to do with the, the influence of cerebral blood pressure that TOS causes, and we will get back to that. I will talk, I will talk briefly about it. TOS-induced craniovascular hyperperfusion phenomenon, TOS-CVH. We published a paper on this two years ago now. It is well known that a majority, a vast amount of TOS patients also suffer from diffuse craniological comorbidities. Occipital, also known, often known as hypertensive migraines, occipital headaches, vertigo, tinnitus, fatigue, etc. In some severe incidences, they may develop narcolepsy, seizures, diffuse syncopal events, they might develop postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and other diffuse strange 
phenological conditions that don't seem to have other explanations. It was previously thought that these craniological comorbidities were caused by rotational or positional insufficiency of the vertebral arteries. F fairly few papers from back in the, most of them are fairly old, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, have found that a few, very few of these patients develop positional rotational strangulation of the vertebral artery. And although this, have, although this has just happened, although this is a rare occurrence, this is a rare occurrence, but it has been cited over and over and over and over and over, making it seem like it's a common problem, and it is not. The reason that I personally got into vascular ultrasound was because I was convinced that I could kill my patients if I was not, if I tried to treat them without realizing that they had some kind of vascular problem arterial compromise. So I got into ultrasound and I quick, fairly quickly realized that these patients, they don't have strangulation of the vertebral artery. And as I got more competent in the use of ultrasound, vascular ultrasound, I realized that not, not only do they not show any, any signs of low pressure, of obstruction, Quite the contrary, these patients showed evidence of high pressure. And this is actually what happens. Now, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but as the subclavian artery passes through the interscalene triangle, right before the interscalene triangle, you have the vertebral artery and the common growth artery branching off the subclavian artery, passing to the brain. And if you strangle, not necessarily completely obstruct, but if you add some degree of, of, of compression to that subclavian artery, distal to the branches that go to the brain, there will be some degree of less blood flow to the arm, and there will be a restriction of entry. And that restriction will cause some reversion, retrogradation of flow towards the brain. And that is why these patients have high head blood pressure, cranial vascular hyperperfusion. That's what it means more flow is reverted to the head. The body does not compensate for this very well, so it tends to call, well, it call, it tends to instigate the paradoxical event where you have low arm pressures but very high head pressures, which is interesting. You can read more about this in our 2020 paper named Does Thoracic Autosomal Cause Cerebral Vascular Hyperperfusion? Uh, you can see the citation here in the lower left corner. As I said, rotational obstruction of the subclavian artery it is common, but it also causes obstruction in neutral position. How do we know that it's not caused by the vertebral artery? Well, number one, we can just do the ultrasound with rotation and we will easily see that there is no obstruction. But another thing uh, for the listeners is that if you have rotational obstruction of the vertebral artery, and this is well documented in the literature, you turn your head and the patient might develop blindness or pass out or whatever, and then they turn their neck back and they are literally normal. Now, for those of us who treat these patients and, 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 and examine these patients, we all know that these patients most certainly do not return to normal when they turn their back and when they turn their necks to neutral. So that's maybe the most logical, obvious. Um, clue I can give about that empirical evidence. Let's move on. <clears throat> Let's talk now about a tip, more typical TOS examination. I will not really go into the details of TOS CVH as for um, as for the diagnosis of that. Review the paper that I cited. For in general, for thoracic autosynome you first want to exclude radiculopathy, which means nerve root spine, a spine problem. If you have multiple nerve root compression, and multiple levels of nerve root compression, that can certainly mimic uh, plexopathic symptoms because the symptoms spread and exceed what you would see in mono neuropathy or single root dermatome affection. I recommend always including a sagittal oblique sequence because the cervical phenomena, they are actually, they, they are 45 degree pointing 
and often you don't see if there's stenosis it's hard, can be hard to grade that especially in borderline cases if you don't have that sequence i recommend to always always include that obviously you also want to exclude systemic causes of neuropathy so diabetes and so on but obviously history and triggers still differ from cos if you have a patient with severe neck pain at, uh, or shoulder chest pain whatever that's always worse with arm loading that's not very likely to be ms or diabetic neuropathy the first test that I like to perform is the Edens test or the costoclavicular compression test. This test is performed by drawing the patient's shoulders back and squeezing them down. In the textbooks, the test is noted as positive by pushing the shoulder down and immediately triggering a symptom. I can tell you right now that you will find very few positive tests. You will have a huge amount of false negatives if you do it like that. Not recommended. What should be done, in my opinion, obviously, is that you should pull the shoulder, tell the patient, cue the patient to pull the shoulders back and squeeze them down and then continuously squeeze them down for a solid 30 seconds or more. If that reproduces the symptoms or cause any type of tingling in the fingers, any kind of neuropathic pain or discomfort in the neck, chest, shoulder blade, shoulder, arm or hand, that's a positive test, even if it doesn't necessarily exactly reproduce the patient's symptoms, because they might need to hold that position for much longer to truly trigger their symptoms. For example, if the patient carries a backpack for two hours and feels horrible afterwards, it's very unlikely that you will trigger any significant symptoms from this test by holding it for 30 seconds, although indeed they are suffering from costoclavicular syndrome, thoracic alpha syndrome. The next test that I recommend is the the ruse test. Uh, the ruse test is fairly sensitive. It's a, sen it's a good test. It, it tends to be positive even when the other tests are falsely negative. For the ruse test, you lift both of the arms up to 90 degrees. Let's see if you can see the eyes the other way. It's mirror imaged. And you have the connotation completely open and completely close your hands as fast as they possibly can. A common cheat that's done here that you should be aware of is that a lot of patients, when they get tired, they start to just marginally open their hands. And when they do that, they can move on, they can carry on for much longer. And if you let them fool you like that, you might be tricked into thinking that the test is normal. It's not normal. So have it completely open, completely close. And if you continue to tell them to open your fingers properly and they're not doing it, that's a strong sign that they probably, the test is probably positive. Either way, you're looking for severe fatigue or discomfort pain within 30 seconds usually usually within 20 but let's say within 30 seconds i also recommend the morley's test this test has maybe a 50 60 percent sensitivity you basically just flick your fingers squeeze your fingers into the brachial plexus of the patient severe pain elicitation is a positive test if that's negative might be a false negative because some patients get numb to crude pressure, which is interesting. Uh, in those cases, you can merely hold, maintain pressure to the nerves and see if it starts to run down the arm or shoulder or chest. If it does, that's still a positive test. Then we have Selmonowski's white hand sign. Lift both arms as high as you possibly can. Be aware of the lighting because the lighting can trick you. You're looking for one or both hands to go carcass-like pale within, well, within a minute, but usually within 30 seconds. I also recommend palpating the peripheral nerves. Start with the Morley's test. Then you can go to the quadrangular space for the axillary nerve. Uh, you can go to coracobrachialis for the musculocutaneous nerve. You can palpate the ulnar nerve down here with the, uh, beneath the adjacent to the medial tricep, cubital tunnel. You can go to the pronated teres for the, um, the median nerve, supinator muscle for the radial nerve and so on. Give it a good squeeze. If it hurts a lot, not normal. And there's a common saying that if you squeeze hard enough, it's gonna hurt for everyone. Yeah, I mean, that's a half truth for sure. When you examine patients often, you will, and you do this exam, you will easily 
will easily be able to distinguish what is normal and what is not normal, and especially when compared to the clinical symptoms. So it's not that simple. It's not so simple as if you push hard enough, it will hurt for everyone. Absolutely not that simple. I also recommend doing an upper limb myotome exam. This is sometimes, well, this is a, always, honestly, all, always useful to do before and after the Eden's test. Because when you do the Eden's test, you squeeze the collarbone into the nerves, into the brachial plexus, and a lot of patients will develop more weakness after that test, which will be indicative of thoracic upper syndrome. So you can first just do a baseline exam of the of the myotomes. You C5, A reduction, bicep, uh, I like to do the separating the index finger and thumb for the median nerve, uh, wrist extension, radial nerve, elbow extension, uh, radial nerve as well, and then pulling the pinky and thumb apart for the ulnar nerve. You can also do finger A reduction for the T1 nerve. And if you have, if there's various levels of weakness that does not grade four or less, that is, not com that is not compatible with the MRI findings, that's most likely TOS related. Then you can confirm that by pulling the shoulders back and down, holding the test for a while, holding the test position for a while, and if the patient is even weaker after that, well, there you go. That's the cause of the weakness, almost guaranteed. <coughs> Excuse me. Some patients with more aggressive flexopathies, they might do, they might develop mimics of upper motor neuron signs. They might have a hot positive Hoffman's test, for example, and they might also develop hyperreflexia. And, and if you check their myotomes, they will usually be weak. After treatment, interestingly, we will see that that hyperreflexia turns into hyporeflexia. The Hoffman sign goes away and the strength gradually comes back. Cervical retraction test. That's a test for TOSCVH. It's a tricky test. I would say high pulse negative rate because there's so many things influencing it. But technically, you're looking to pull the neck as far back as possible, holding the position for 30 to 60 seconds, looking for exacerbation of migraine, tinnitus, headache, um, induction of presyncope, etc. Ultimately, and in my opinion, the gold standard confirmation for thoracic alpha syndrome, although it does not have 100% sensitivity, it does have, in my opinion, 100% specificity, is worsening of TOS symptoms after scalene strengthening. Now, the strengthening of scalene is the treatment for TOS in mild to moderate circumstances, but because, treat, because strengthening inducing inflammation, and inflammation will temporarily, although it is necessary to, to, to induce growth, to stimulate growth, it will temporarily worsen the symptoms. So if we strengthen the scalenes, maybe a little bit harder than we should do for diagnostic purposes, if we're not sure if the patient has TOS or not, uh, twice per week, and you do that for a solid two, three weeks, and the patient gradually starts to develop consistent worsening, flaring of their symptoms, their exact symptoms, after this, uh, after the strengthening, usually the day after, and for days even if you go too hard, then that would be a nail in the coffin for the diagnosis. So in cases where I'm not really sure if the patient, if, or maybe I'm sure that the patient has TOS, but I'm not sure if this exact symptom is caused by TOS or something else, we are really looking to do these exercises and see if we can trigger the patient's symptoms with that. Because if we do, there will be little to no doubt that it is induced by thoracic alpha syndrome. <clears throat> plexus imaging. Brachial plexus imaging is not all that useful. It's not very useful. It is useful to exclude you know, nerve tumors or hematomas, any type, any fracture, any type, of, you know, anything, any type of, of mass that would disturb the nerve function. But with regards to demonstrating hyperintensity, so inflammation of the nerves or poor space for, for the nerves, I've reviewed thousands of these scans and I've seen only one single scan actually demonstrating Hyperintensity. It was a scan done, I don't remember his name, I think it's Demadian, something like that, 
uh, the guy who invented the MRI. It was a scan done at his clinic a couple of years ago, and I think they got the patients, they, they did the MRI in the acute phase. So it was still very inflamed, and, we, and the, the MRI was beautiful. We had very small slice thickness and high, re, high resolution, small slice thickness, beautiful images. And we were, we were actually able to demonstrate hyperintensity from lower trunk of the brachial plexus. But it, I've only seen this once, my friends. So don't rely on that. You can certainly order a plexus MRI to exclude avulsion injury. You know, if the wolf is pulled out, let's say they had a traction injury, exclude that, exclude masses, etc. But for, for the inclusion of a diagnosis of TOS, don't bet on it. No, it's not reliable. Qui, in their systematic review, they found that MR neurographies in general were heterogeneous in the detection, so not unreliable in the detection of entrapment neuropathies in general. Like I said, if you want to do this, it will have to be high, low slice thickness, high resolution. Even then, it costs a lot of money, it takes a long time to render, and even then, not very useful. Electrodiagnostics. This is another common pitfall, diagnostic pitfall for a lot of physicians. We order EDX, not being well familiar with TOS nor the research on the topic. It is not very helpful. Um, Rusev, they did a very interesting study because they had 22 patients with, I think it was 22, either 20 or 22 patients with uh, surgically proven neurovascular compression. So very, very good study. And they did correlative electrodiagnostic studies on these patients and it found that a staggering 90%, 90%, my friends, had completely normal electrodiagnostic studies. So please do not rely on these studies for the inclusion of TOS. Another thing is that even when these studies come back positive, they, they don't tend to come back positive for TOS. They tend to they come back positive for ulnar entrapment or, or carpal tunnel syndrome or whatever that tends to just mislead and confuse the, the ordering physician if they are not aware of these tendencies. So you, you can certainly refer the patient for ED electrodiagnostic studies, and it can be very useful for the exclusion of, let's see, autoimmune neuropathies, for example, but for the inclusion of thoracic alpha syndrome, in my experience, it's not very good for entrapments in general, but that might be, well, some people would certainly disagree with that, which doesn't concern me all that much, to be honest. But either way, for TOS, the consensus is useless useless. Rousseff and colleagues, they concluded that EDX is futile. They use the term futile in the diagnosis of thoracic alpha syndrome. <clears throat> now, what about vascular imaging? Personally, I prefer a, a CT angiogram. When I ask, when I have patients with thoracic alpha syndrome, especially if they also have head uh, comorbidities, Craniological comorbidities. I tend to ask for CT angiogram from the head and down to down to the the um, down to the heart, including the subclavian arteries with the arms up. If you do that, you can look at the vasculature of the entire head, all including the veins, head, neck, and the subclavian arteries. It's a very useful exam, but the contrast needs to be infused through the femoral vein. Because on the CT scan, if you infuse the contrast through the arm, the vein on that side will be so saturated with contrast that it's hard to really evaluate the ipsilateral vasculature well. So I recommend infusion of contrast via the femoral vein. And then I will, well, as mentioned, head to heart, including the subclavian arteries with the arms elevated. One thing I really like about the CT angiogram is that if you open it as a 3D rendering in your, in your DICOM software. If you play around with the windowing, which is the signal intensity, you might be able to demonstrate the signal attenuation at the interscaling triangle. The interscaling triangle, I have, well, I have personally, I've never seen a case where I was able to demonstrate that on an MRI. So the CT scan is very helpful for this. You might be able to demonstrate attenuation of signal. It's not going to look like it does here because we have severe compression at the costal clavicular space, but you might be able to see attenuation, the 
increase of signal through that interscaling triangle. And that will be highly indicative of thoracic albuminopathy, obviously, especially if there is clinical correlation, which there probably is, which is probably why the images were ordered in the first place. If you don't want to radiate, you don't want a CT angiogram, then I recommend doing an MR angiogram with TOF. TOF is a time of flight computer simulated flow sequence. If those images are equivocal, non conclusive, then follow up with a CT angiogram. The Doppler exam is really the most helpful. Well, that might, that's a half truth. The Doppler exam is the most useful exam for mechanical compression, severe compression of the circulated artery. However, it is very user dependent. If you do the exam wrong, the results will be normal, even if the patient has TOS, unless they have dramatic influence of, of even simple arm positioning, because the arm position, positioning needs to be done correctly. And if it's not, and <laughs> to do it correctly, you need to have a good understanding of the disorder. So, unless that's done correctly, you might have a high false negative rate. It's also very fast, readily available, and cost effective. <clears throat> what I do here is that I examine, I do the subclavian artery, sorry, the axillary artery, so I measure the axillary artery down here, and I do so in neutral, arm completely raised, and importantly, and this is a shortcoming of the CT and MRI, especially the MRI, with the shoulder back and down. Because a lot of patients will not have stenosis of the subclavian vasculature with the arm up, merely with your arm up, they need to put the shoulder blade back and down to compress that costoclavicular space. You see, when you put the arm up, most patients there develop compression of the subclavian vasculature due to pectoralis minor tightness. Not everyone, but most of them, in my experience. So you need to put the arm all the way up, really elevate that scapula and put all put the arm all the way up like that, and then you scan for changes. If that's normal, so it meaning that you have a good velocity, uh, normally around 100 centimeters per second, good flow velocity, and at least biphasic and preferably triphasic uh, Doppler waveforms, then it's a normal exam. Now, if you move on and you squeeze that shoulder back and down, the patient tends to sh show grimaces when they do this, they need to really squeeze that shoulder back and down. I tend to push it down for them and until I see that they're visibly uncomfortable <clears throat> and I tell them to hold them there. And then you need to do the exam fast because they're not comfortable. And obviously you look for signs of reduction of flows. So you look for monophasic waveforms, those tar, preferably those tardis, parvus waveforms that you just have a little bump instead of that phasicity that we normally see with low speed. So it's going to be, well, empirically, in my experience, 50 centimeters per second, centimeters per second or less. And often down the road, if you're having, if you're, if you're demonstrating tardis parvus waveforms, which are indicative of occlusion or neuroclusion, then, um, then you will certainly see around 30 centimeters per second or less. <clears throat> you might be able to be to get a little bit more sensitive with readings down at the radial or ulnar arteries, but personally, I don't bother with that uh, because if, if the arterial compromise or is just not that bad if um, if you have to go down to ulnar arteries. <clears throat> what about the veins? Well, for the veins, you can look for literal visualization, mechanical stenosis of the subclavian vein as they elevate the arm or pull, pull the shoulder back and down. What you can also do is um, squeeze the shoulder back and down or put the arm up and then look at the axillary part of the vein and do valsalva maneuver. And if there is no cessation of flow, that would suggest proximal stenosis. Okay, so let's talk about intervention very important topic. The first and most important intervention for thoracic alpha syndrome, and this is especially for the most common variant, which is neurogenic, flexogenic thoracic alpha syndrome, and that is scapular height. Make no mistake that if the patient continues 
to slouch with the shoulders and continues to carry trace the scapular dyskinesia, continues to jam that collarbone into the nerves, they will not get better. And this is the most common cause of recurrence of symptoms after surgery as well. So the scapular height and dyskinesia must be addressed, and especially scapular height, because the dyskinesia, well, if the patient wishes to return to aggressive activity, yes. If they just want to be pain-free sitting in a couch or at the office, might not be at the same level of importance. Either way, scapular height is extremely important. On the side here, we have a young lady with, in whom I diagnosed thoracic outlet syndrome, terrible neck pain, headaches, periscapular pain, pain in the arms and chest. Had a history of that, a history of anxiety. Her physicians believed that her symptoms were psychogenic, which is a half truth. The symptoms are not psychogenic, but you can certainly argue that at the top of the pyramid in TOS, in many patients are is is a psychogenic diagnosis, meaning that the patient, for whatever reason, is very tense, very tense, usually stress related holding a breath very tense for many years, poor posture, causing TOS. Uh, the TOS is caused by the bracing, which is why we have to address the bracing as well. We're going to get to that. But the first thing I recommend is that the patient has to literally hold their shoulders up. We can certainly do surgery. We can remove the first rib. We can even remove the second rib, right, as many surgeons did back in the 80s. Remove even the second rib. My good friend Carlos Salmanovsky told me that they, re they would remove the first rib, then they would move the arm around after removal and see if they could still cause compression of the brachial plexus to the second rib. And if they did, they would remove the second rib as well. And that might be, but it is certainly much easier to simply elevate the shoulders. This requires patient, compl patient compliance and motivation, of course, but in the end, one has to do what is best for their body, and I think if we explain this mechanism well to our patients, it is much easier for them to, to be motivated and do these changes. In general, I recommend that the patient elevates their shoulder by about half an inch or one centimeter if they're doing non-strenuous activities, so walking around, sitting at a computer, uh, sitting in a chair, whatever, half an inch of elevation, that's enough. When Partaking in strenuous activity, now strenuous would depend on the patient and the degree of affliction, but I recommend an inch to even an inch and a half, so up to three, four centimeters in some cases, especially let's say you're bench pressing, for example, you want to have a good margin of error, a large space between the collarbone and the brachial plexus. So for example, if I raise my shoulder blades like this, do the bench press, you can see if I drop my shoulder, lots of space for the brachial plexus, and it's also a good technique. Carrying groceries, get those shoulders up. Working overhead, get those shoulders up. Do not load the arms and shoulders with your shoulders down. The next, well, dyskinesia is a little broader topic. We want the scapula to rotate into upward rotation during, especially elevation of the arms. Uh, I'm not really going into details on that topic in this lecture but you can read my literature for free on my website, mskneurology.com, or see other videos on this YouTube channel. Now, the next very important aspect, and this will, this will, this will be very important for patients who develop TOS symptoms out of the blue. You ask them, well, did you have any kind of head neck injury? They say no. Uh, or, or they say something that you know is not relevant, like, yeah, I fell off fell down from that bed when I was three years old and then the symptoms started when they were 22. It's not going to be relevant, right? Um, and you examine the scapular positioning and, and, um, and movement and you find that, well, although it might not be perfect, it's not monstro it's not, there is no monstrosity, so to say, and then most likely it's a psychogenic problem where the patient is stressed in general or over something. Let's say the patient maybe developed TOS after having a divorce or whatever. And you find the patient is very, very tense, and then they have to deal with their bracing. And I found that, well, some anxiolytic treatment, some anxiolytic medicine might certainly help. I found that psychotherapy 
does not tend to help, in my experience at least. Uh, and I've not done this psychotherapy myself. I'm, I have no expertise in that, but I've referred the patients out and seen nothing in return. So what I have found to be most helpful is anxiolytic medicine in some patients combined with being cognizant of our habits. So for example, I will tell the patient to use your fingers. Don't just feel, because a lot of patients, they, they do this subconsciously. Use your fingers. Grab the packs and feel, am I clenching my packs? Do the same for the abdomen. Am I clenching my abdomen? Check if you're holding your breath. You can also touch the, the, the subcostal area and see, am I, am I sucking with a di am I clenching a diaphragm? I'm sucking that diaphragm in. And if you are, stop doing it. And then have the patient check this every 30 minutes to one hour. And every time they catch themselves bracing, stop bracing. And although it might not, there might not be any noticeable change from week to week, but in my experience, for the absolute majority of patients, even if they still have anxiety, there will be improvements month to month if they're motivated. And only in, only in few and very severe cases of psychiatric disorder will these interventions have no effect whatsoever. So for the majority of patients, will be effective. Now, next point, scaling being weak and tight. Why is it weak and tight? Well, because the patient is bracing all the time, holding their breath, low shoulder blades inhibits the function of the scaling, but also it seems to me that it also causes inflammation of the muscles. So what I recommend, obviously, stop the bracing, stop the breath holding, get the shoulders up, and then slowly but surely stimulate growth of the muscle. I recommend careful, gentle scaling strengthening once or twice a week, depending on how bad the symptoms are. Aim for mild worsening for one day after training. If you feel worse for two, three, four days after your training, you're training way too hard. And I can also mention that the regulation of this is very important because the pain Chronic overtrainers, so to say, they can train for a year and they will not get better. So this is very, this is very important. Less is more when it comes to scaling rehabilitation. Aggressive incidence of COS, I recommend scaline. Well, I recommend scalenectomy, COS decompressive surgery, uni or bilaterally, along with scapular elevation and obviously the bracing uh, approach. Scapular elevation is mandatory surgery or non-surgery, make no mistake. It is absolutely mandatory regardless of undergoing surgery. You might have to address peripheral entrapment sites. For example, you might have to uh, start um, strengthening of the serious minor, for example, for axillary nerve entrapment or coracobrachialis for muscular cutaneous entrapment, etc. Um, ulnar entrapment is also very common, so I can mention that quickly. I would recommend flexor carpal virus strengthening. I have videos of that on my YouTube channel. Uh, and medial tricep strengthening for the radial nerve, supinator strengthening. And, um, well, median nerve is common as well. You can do pronator teary strengthening. Uh, but for the median nerve, my experience is that it's usually mainly related to the collarbone and the scalene, unless the patient has frank carpal tunnel syndrome as well. Real carpal tunnel syndrome, not just carpal tunnel mimicking from TOS, where they might need to strengthen the wrist flexors, stretch the uh, finger flexors, and strengthen the finger extensors, in addition to the TOS correctives. <clears throat> I recommend surgery if the patient has debilitating craniological comorbidities, or if they simply cannot tolerate the conservative treatment. If the patient tells you, I can't tolerate holding my shoulders up, no, no, that, that, that is not true. Every patient can tolerate holding their shoulders up. But they might not tolerate the scalene strengthening, and that is my main indicating factor. Uh, if I prescribe scalene strengthening and a patient can only tolerate maybe one repetition per week, it's still possible to treat it per se, but it's going to take years. So I would recommend surgical intervention in a case like that. Let's talk a little bit about injection therapy, Botox. Uh, number one, Botox and injection therapy will not address the costoclavicular space. The bony compression site, i.e. the most sinister element in uh, thoracic outer syndrome. So even if you perform um, 
injection therapy for TOS, the patient has to hold their shoulders up. There's no getting away from that. It is mandatory. Um, brachial plexus hydrodissection can certainly be helpful. You can also do hydrodissection of secondary entrapment sites. Botox, I have a conflicted relationship with Botox because it kills the muscle. You ever seen a leg after you took a fractured leg after you took the cast off? There's nothing left of that leg, right? Well, the same will happen when you do Botox. So if we, like I said, the, the, the real problem here is severe scalene weakness. If we do Botox of that scalene and it was weak to begin with, there's just no hope to rehabilitate it after that, most likely. So I only recommend scalene Botox as symptomatic relief if you already decide that you will do surgery. If you don't want surgery, do not get scalene Botox. Stay away from Botox. Um, if you're on the hold, you're not sure yet what you want to do, stay off the Botox. Only do Botox if you already know you want surgery. Pectoralis minor Botox, however, can be uh, helpful in some cases. I don't really recommend cutting the anatomy of the pec minor surgically removing, uh, at least removing the tendon, cutting the tendon, I don't recommend that because it's, it, it's a muscle that responds very well to conservative treatment. Why is it so tight? Well, because patients have their shoulders down and they have scapular dyskinesia and they're braced. So get their shoulders up, have them stop clenching their pecs, so check the pecs often, and if they clench, stop doing so, and stretch the pecs three times per week, and this will go away. If it's extremely severe, that, or if the patient just is not very motivated, you can try Botox of the pec minor. It's not irreversible, it's okay. But don't Botox the scalenes unless you know you want surgery. That's my recommendation. Failed surgery is an interesting, <clears throat> interesting topic. There is some consensus that most recurrences of symptoms after surgery is caused by inadequate resection of the first rib. The patient should, as we see here in the upper right image, the patient should have a clear discrepancy in shoulder resting height after successful first rib removal. Should be a clear difference in resting height. If it's not, most likely insufficient amount of rib was removed and the patient might still be compressing the brachial plexus and subclavian vasculature, especially the nerves towards the, fur, the stump of the first strips. So that's a very common thing to be aware of. Should we recommend revision surgery? Personally, I don't do that. I just have them get their shoulders up. I hope that makes sense. Now, even if the patient undergoes successful and adequate first rib removal, a lot of patients still get recurrence of symptoms. Why? Well, I already mentioned a lot of reasons why. But a very common cause is that now, you know, the shoulder will drop down and now they're compressing to the second rib. So we're back to what I said on the earlier slide, shoulders have to come up. It is mandatory surgery or non-surgery. Shoulders need to come up and they need to stay there. When the patient gets tired, they can certainly use some type of elbow rest, arm rest to keep their shoulders up. But when they're moving around and especially loading, they got to keep the shoulders up. Now, what are some non-mechanical causes for this? What are some non-mechanical causes for continued symptoms or recurrence of symptoms? Presuming, of course, there's no iatrogenic surgical uh, result, for example, accidental snipping of the brachial plexus or anything like that. Um, then we would be talking about continued severe anxiety or similar problems, psychiatric disorder, that results in a lot of bracing, very, very tense patients. Try to get them medicated, try to have them focus on their bracing. If they can't, not much to do in my experience. But most patients will not be in this group. In the absolute majority of patients, you will be able to help them. Uh, another fairly common problem is that, especially in severe sufferers, is that you have to treat the peripheral entrapment sites. And you, have to, you may, might have to treat various so do the peripheral nerve exam, check which muscles are to do the, also do the myotome exam, find out which nerves are mainly affected, and start treating those sites. Okay, so we have come to the end of this lecture. Talk about some takeaways. 
TOS, thoracic alpha syndrome, is a disorder predominantly afflicting patients with anxiety and high stress. Interesting, isn't that? Most of these patients will be diagnosed with anxiety or fibromyalgia. But high stress anxiety causes thoracic alpha syndrome. I am left without a single strain of doubt that this is what's happening. So they need to treat the tension. If we deal with the tension, how they let the stress manifest, we can keep being anxious, but we will still be able to treat the physical affliction. Uh, as I said, that's two thirds of these patients tend to be stressed, or some kind of psychiatric disorder patient. When I say psychiatric, I don't necessarily mean that the patient is crazy, but they might have some degree of stressor that is sufficient in producing a lot of tension in their bodies. The last one third tends to be some kind of head neck injury. If you have a patient that has either a head neck history of head neck injury one year or less prior to onset of symptoms or a lot of stress in one year or less prior to, prior to onset of symptoms and they're suffering from any, especially upper limb diffuse neuralgic disorder, neuralgic symptoms, consider thoracic autosomal. Thoracic autosynome is not rare, it is common, and I would dare to say that thoracic autosynome is as common as radiculopathy. That might come as a shock to a lot of people. It might sound ridiculous to some, but this has been my experience. Now, you are, of course, welcome to make up your own decisions and um, make your own experiences. Early onset of thoracic autosynome, it tends to onset insidiously. It can mimic mononeuropathies such as carpal tunnel syndrome or scapular pain, dorsal scapular neuralgia, very common. Neck MRI will be normal or incompatible. So, for example, if you have um, if you have a C5 lesion and the symptom ha the patient has ulnar symptoms, yeah, that's a non-compatible MRI. But obviously, there will be overlap between radiculopathy and um, and TOS and a careful distinguishment of the two clinical, careful clinical exams should be, do, should be done. <clears throat> Worsening of symptoms with arm loading is the most important indicator of neuro neurogenic TOS. Clinical exam is much more important than imaging and electrodiagnostic studies. The most important and immediate intervention for thoracic is to get those shoulders up. Get that collarbone off the nerves. We're talking, there's a bony compression site. Bones are literally compressing the brachial plexus. You get those shoulders up, the bony compression goes away. It is that simple. And now it might sound simple, but holding your shoulders up all the time is difficult. And the more motivated the patient is, the quicker you will see results. The patient might develop a lot of tightness in the trapezius and levator scapular muscles from holding the shoulders up. That is completely normal. Get adequate rest. So when you start to get really tight in your neck, get rest. Use elbow support. Get your shoulders up passively. Use some kind of elbow support. Rest sufficiently. <clears throat> in mild to moderate incidences of TOS, get the shoulders up, and then continue that, in, in addition to that, strengthening of the entrapping muscles that would just generally be scalenes, and it could be some kind of peripheral problem as well, but don't strengthen the pec minor. I recommend stretching the pec minor. The pec minor tends to be strong, not weak, because the patient's bracing, stress-related. There are, of course, caveats to this, but Generally, this has been my experience. In severe incidence of thoracic alpha syndrome, so point number three, which is scapular elevation, scapular elevation and surgical decompression. And it should also say here, dealing with the bracing problem, if there is one. This will be important for a patient who develops TOS symptoms out of the blue. Uh, it will not be so important if the patient develops TOS, let's say, after a neck injury, because that's mechanical trauma, basically. There's nothing suggesting that it's a psychiatric illness. Surgical failure, recurrence of symptoms, often due to inadequate first rib resection, can also be due to uh, compression to the second rib, so you've got to get the shoulders up, very important, and the patient has to stop 
bracing. Get them to stop bracing and holding their breath all the time. Use medication if necessary, but usually often being cognizant of the bracing habits in and by itself is enough. If the symptoms are, if the, if the psychiatric disorder is severe, then combination therapy might be necessary. And as a reiteration there, identification of bracing, so stress, anxiety, slash psychiatric disorder, stressors, stressors, that's what we're talking about. Identify them and deal with them. For most patients, like I said, being cognizant of your habits and using your fingers to check if you're clenching tends to be the most useful, especially for men, as men tend to be less in touch <laughs> with themselves rather than women. But I also recommend using the fingers for, for that, that, that palpative feedback for women as well. Okay, so this was my lecture on thoracic outlet syndrome. I've been thinking of doing this for a while. I hope that this video, this lecture will be helpful for uh, some of you, and I, I'm sure that it will be. I have been using this protocol for a long time. I know that it works, and I hope that you'll find it useful. Now, uh, if you have questions, leave them in the comments section below, and I wish you all um, a great evening, and thank you for watching.